So this guy coming because uh, just to do the introduction and uh, et tu peux venir vers moi Christophe si tu veux du coup tu, tu nous as dans le dans le cadre test test c'est bon bonjour bon timing <rire> on va commencer <coughs> tu me dis quand c'est bon Très bien, je vais commencer cette petite introduction en français et puis on va passer à l'anglais après. Euh, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Euh, on va encore vivre un moment très intéressant ce soir. On a la chance de recevoir toute l'équipe euh, du Hacken Continuum. Et euh, vous allez voir que cet instrument, si vous ne le connaissez pas encore, est exceptionnel. Et je pèse mes mots. Et euh, ben non seulement ce soir vous allez l'entendre, mais en plus euh, on va vous raconter comment il a été fait. Enfin pas moi, l'équipe va vous raconter comment il a été fait. Donc euh, j'espère que ça vous plaira. Et euh, eh bien on est parti. Euh, si vous avez des questions, alors ça va être en anglais, si vous avez des questions, si vous voulez qu'on tradu qu traduise, n'hésitez pas à le demander. D'accord Et on fera ça euh, en direct. Ok guys, thank you very much. Uh, you know what, I was uh, telling to myself that uh, we are very lucky to do this kind of job because uh, we, uh, we, we meet incredible people and uh, we play with incredible instruments and uh, I'm very happy and we are very lucky to have you tonight. So thank you very much to, to be there. Uh, because I think the Continuum is one of the most interesting instruments uh, to play uh, today. And um, we will try to, to understand why, uh, because uh, specifically with this instrument, I can, we can use a lot of words to explain what it is, but it is the first time you, is, you will play with this, you will understand. You need to, to take your hand, uh, you need to play with this to understand what is really this instrument, what you can feel with it. But tonight, as you can't uh, use your hands, uh, we'll try to explain why it is cool. And at some points, when you want to try this, you can come to Modular Square because we are very lucky to have one. Thank you very much to, 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 um, to let us having one. So you can uh, at any time try one here. Okay, so before we will start, I, will, I would like to introduce the, uh, the team. So. First, Mr. Lippold, Robert Lippold. So you are the creator of uh, the Continuum Fingerboard. Uh, then uh, uh, we have some developers here. So Ed again, um, uh, who have worked on the Egan Matrix. And uh, Christophe Duquesne, uh, which is also a sound designer and a programmer. So thank you very much. And uh, Before the talk, I think it's um, uh, maybe you want to say something first. I will give you the mic. But before the talk, I think playing first is more interesting. So what do you want? Do you want to do, do a little introduction? Uh, or Yeah, I'll just uh, say quickly that uh, what I'll do on the, on the beginning here is just play a few different sounds that, uh, that are inside the continuum and the uh, Egan matrix. And uh, just explain that... Um, The Continuum is a self-contained unit, and what I have is the laptop up here, and I'm using it slowly to, uh, slowly to change sounds. And you can also use the laptop to edit um, particular sounds. But, but all the sound generation is done internally in the Continuum through its internal DSP shark. Yes. It's very important to say that, because everyone that is trying this ear told me, okay, where does the sound come from? Well, inside this beast. So, uh, first playing, thank you very much.
Okay, so now maybe you understand why this instrument is fabulous, and uh, but you have to be a good performer too. So it's not only the instrument; you have to be you not to you have to know how to play it also. Uh, yeah, this instrument is it's I think it's easy to play because uh, I grew up playing oboe and piano, and uh, that that was torture. You know, and I think in the number of hours that I played there, but compared to the accessibility of the designs of synthesis, this was not made to be a thing to pick up because it's counterintuitive to say that something is 
can be expressive and easy because it's like you're it's like saying that you're the the the, exp the expression in your soul is very surfacey but in actual fact it takes a long time to really dig into it and uh, figure those things out so like a regular instrument it takes a while to play it yeah. Yeah. but but it's something like this last one that I played that anything that's more of a sound design type thing I mean it just takes a sensitivity to touch if I want to do something pitch sure you know you have to learn how to finger and play intervals and there's no you know there's visual markings but there's no physical markings uh, bumps that are you know haptic markings that tell you what to do so uh, s things like that sound effects uh, thing you can play and just use your ear and respond to it and that's one beauty of this instrument is that it is so uh, into uh, tied into what your fingers are telling you to do that you can respond and shape the sound in real time before going to a deep introduction, can you just explain what it is and why it is special? Um, well, why don't I pass over to Lippo and he can... Uh, yeah, sure. Since he has a special relationship <laughs> with this thing. <laughs> yes, uh, so I, I've been uh, working on this instrument for 30 years, but I'm not a very good musician, so uh, it's good to know the talented people. Um, but the, uh, the idea of the instrument is that... Uh, in this direction, which you usually f use for pitch, it's very accurate to about 30 microns, which seems funny since you have a fat finger. Uh, you know, how, how can it matter with 30 microns? But if you think about it like on a violin or something, uh, I, I grew up playing violin, it, when you roll your fingers and you listen to the beats melt away, uh, the center of gravity of your finger, that, that really is to 30 microns. You can do the math and figure that out. So this uh, surface, when I was working on it uh, since the uh, early 1980s, I knew I needed that kind of accuracy. And then uh, there's also pressure sensitivity and uh, some front to back sensitivity. And it's independent for each finger. Um, so that it has to be very accurate in uh, value, especially in pitch, because the human ear is so sensitive to that. But And it also has to be uh, timing accurate. And that's where it really differs from uh, keyboard instruments because uh, here the idea is that you're in a timbre feedback loop. If you think of, say, a theremin or something, uh, the reason a the theremin is in tune is because you're part of the feedback loop and you adjust. And so here it's the same sort of idea. You're part of the feedback loop, uh, not just for pitch, but also for what it sounds like. And uh, so it's this timbre feedback loop, very much like, a, like you'd have in a theremin. And... Um, Unlike a theremin, more like a Martineau, this has a, uh, you're touching the surface. And in, uh, in some ways that makes it easier, except it's also polyphonic. So <laughs> it's, uh, this is it's different yes, because yes, of that, yes. It, it, it's yet, yet, yet a different thing. Uh, so it, it, it borrows from uh, a lot of instruments, which is sort of funny, come from the 1920s and 1930s. But uh, yeah. So we have three axes, right? Mm hmm. Uh, we can play like this. We can play from left to right, and and uh, and pressure, and then with uh, the brilliance of uh, Edmund Egan, we developed this Egan matrix, which is a modular, uh, digital modular. But uh, you can. The important thing about that is it's a matrix modular, and at each matrix intersection, uh, you can use the X, Y, Z, or the right to left, front to back, and pressure of each finger to control that, uh, uh, that matrix point. So you have often dozens of, uh, or, or more than dozens of uh, places where X, Y, and Z affect the sound. So in that way, it's much more like an acoustic instrument. If you, if you do a vibrato on a violin, you have the flabby part of your finger, the bony part of your finger uh, at the end of the string, so it affects the timbre during the vibrato cycle. And a similar thing, you can do that here. So it's not just a pitch change and not just a dynamics change, but really a more complicated timbre change. So the, uh, the best sound designs here try to em uh, emulate that and give more of an acoustic feel. In fact, uh, uh, it's been used quite a bit in Hollywood and, in, and also in the game industry, but in both worlds, uh, it's, well, for instance, at Blizzard, you know, the people that make the World of Warcraft and Starcraft and all, all those kinds of games, they use it very heavily. Uh, they have a lot of orchestral music. In fact, I once saw the percentage of classical style orchestral music that's heard in the world, you know, by hours. Uh, it's a very high percentage of it, but the, but the continuum there is not with the synthesizers, it's with the orchestra. And uh, so in that way, it, uh, because of this timbre feedback loop, I think it's uh, much more 
uh, like an acoustic instrument than um, most synthesizers. Yeah, and the fact that there is no touch, touch, uh, you can really play freely. Uh, when you, if you don't play uh, keyboard, for example, it's more natural to play on this because you don't refer to tonal sounds, for example, but you can, for example, experiment with uh, drums. Uh, you can do some slap if you want to do some yep. bass slap. So y you don't have to learn um, keyboard to play this. Uh, if you know how to play keyboard, it's it can be better if you want to play tonal things, but it's not only that you can play everything you want and uh, you can play different different style of playing but i, I think it's uh, similar to the theremin historically uh, when uh, rca sold the theremin you know their tv ads always said oh anybody who can carry a tune can can play this and to some extent that's true and there's some people that are very natural at it when i play a theremin uh, i can make ghost noises but that's about it you know it's just hopeless and so uh so I think it's a similar thing. It, mm -hmm. it, 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 in some ways, it's very easy. In some ways, it isn't. Um, but uh, one of the things that one of the continuum players that plays with singers a lot mentioned is, well, because all the half steps are equal spaced, when the singer goes sharp, you just move over a little bit, but all you're playing is the same. Uh, also, unlike in piano, where if you want to play uh, some pieces, you can only play in one key because of the fingerings. Uh, it's not possible just to transpose to any other key here. It's all the same. So in, in some ways it's uh, easier and, and some ways the offset black and white keys certainly help a lot too. So it's a very different instrument. And I'd say it's, it's sort of like asking, well, is a violin better than a piano? I, they're different and uh, it's just a different thing. Okay, so let's back to the beginning because um, uh, this is something impressive with this instrument. So uh, it's more than 20 years of development yeah, 35. Right? 35, <laughs> 35. So Persistence helps. <laughs> yes. And um, you make it evolve little by little. Yeah. So today is a complete instrument. There is an um, eng uh, audio engine inside. But at the beginning, it was only a controller. So can you explain how all of this begin? And, uh, uh, yes. Uh, originally, it was uh, a controller. And I knew as a violinist and having played in many pit orchestras and such, I knew what kind of accuracies I wanted out of an instrument to control electronics continuously. But uh, it, it really was a, an engineering project uh, until, until I started working with Edmund Egan. Uh, he bought the first one that I sold commercially in 1999. And uh, uh, then eventually we started working together um, a lot. And uh, that's what really made it an instrument because you can accurately sense things, but that's an accurate sensor. It's not an instrument. Yeah. So. Yeah, I could carry on. Yeah, yeah why don't you? I'll just add. Yeah. So um, you're right. Originally, it was just a controller. Um, and when I first bought one, um, I was very excited about it. I had seen it and then decided to buy one when I had the money six months later. And I bought it, and I tried it out. And um, I don't know, it's kind of like things when you do something new or like if I join a gym in January, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very excited about it for three months and then suddenly, you know, there's that glass of wine over there and I know I'm supposed to go to the gym, but, and so I, so after three months I sort of gave up on it and uh, not gave up, but just put it in the back burner and got other things that were interesting. And then about another four months after that, I brought it out again. I said, oh yeah, this is, this is very interesting. Uh, I should, uh, contact uh, Lippo because I have a couple of ideas about it and to my surprise he was very receptive to my input because uh, I'm not used to people listening to me <laughs> so um, and then uh, uh, and at that point it was strictly a um, firewire device and it worked with Kima with the <laughs> symbolic sound Kima and I was quite familiar with Kima and Kima is a very wonderful environment for designing sounds it has a lot of um, uh, possibilities within it um, and so it was it's a great controller for that because there was all these mappings you could take from the playing surface and intimately control aspects of Kima and so as we worked on this we made changes to the hardware made the surface more reliably in place and um, and we got to a certain point that you know, people and we added MIDI to it and and then at a certain point um, uh, people were getting it 
And they were using it with Kima, and Kima is very deep and very, it's very complex, so it's a whole thing to learn on its own. You can spend a lot of time. So to explain, Kima is the Sun yeah. Engine, uh, Sound engine in a box. In a box, its yes. own dedica dedicated DSP, mm -hmm. and its own language. And it's, it's got a, a GUI front end, and it's a whole modular system in DSP uh, with all these very interesting uh, idiosyncratic and beautiful modules that you can hook up. There's a world of possibilities in there, and no one is the master of the whole thing. You, you d dive into certain things that you can do. So what we were noticing when we were, as I was working with Lipold and we were starting to sell these things, um, it was hard because not only did people have to um, learn to play the instrument, but they had to get knowledgeable in the way Kima worked. So it was a double whammy of, like, you're trying to build your own instrument and learn to play it, but at the same time you're building the sound engine. So, and so both, uh, both he and I were, you know, saying, well, this is, you know, there's some, some things that we want to do that aren't quite in Kima. We want to make this thing more um, self-contained. And we decided that we were going to use, um, put a shark into the thing. Lip well, Lipple decided to uh, pick the, the chip. And uh, we would start to do uh, some of the structural designs that we had learned worked well. And we used that as the basis for the beginning of our uh, Ega matrix synthesizer. And so I always liked the idea of a pin matrix. I've always been a fan of the EMS um, um, things. But, you know, uh, when you have a pin matrix, you have a, a series of sources and a series of destinations. And you would plug in a pin, and it would basically give you this relationship. You take the output of the oscillator and feed it into a filter. But and then if you wanted to control the volume, you would, you would put a VCA in the chain. Well, what we decided in our pin matrix is that <coughs> at every single point in the matrix, you could take a mathematical expression excuse me, <coughs> and place that um, expression, which is the relationship of where your finger is in the, which typically the pitch direction in the X, where it is in the Y direction, and where it is in the Z direction, and also with some other um, uh, constant or uh, variable uh, automating uh, type of things like that we call phase generators, that you can, so you can take that whole relationship and put that in a mathematical formula at a particular pinpoint. So on a very simple level, if you take an oscillator and you feed it into a filter, you don't need a VCA because at that pinpoint, you would take, okay, I'll use my Z pressure to create that. So that was kind of the basis of the starting of where the sound engine came from. From the knowledge that I had gained working inside Kima, figuring out what worked well with the continuum, and then us deciding we wanted to do our own special engine within there. <coughs> yes, and as you say, it's very powerful and also very natural because the connection is not only a point, uh, there, if you want to make a connection, take cables and plug inside. But there, you can just say, okay, I want to add X. So uh, the, X axis, uh, the X axis is doing its job. And you don't, it's not really mathematics things, but it's, it's um, when you figure it out the first time, yes, yeah. it's very intuitive to use. And um, so, yeah, I think it's a very powerful thing to, to have. Yeah, that's, uh, what I've we found is with people, well, here's the, the nice thing about it. It's like, so we spent a lot of time designing sounds, and we tried to do certain things that essentially you could customize the sound to a certain extent on the surface. So we have barrel controls, that sort of these meta controls that can you can change certain parameters that we group together. And a lot of our users don't even dive into the engine because there is... The, the patch are too good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yes. but also the, the, that's part of it. But, but typically, if, you know, someone buys a, a, you know, subsequent 37 or, you know, a lot of people, they experiment a little bit, but, or maybe not so much, but maybe in a Roland product or a Yamaha product, mm -hmm. they don't really change the patches very much, you know. They, they will do the performance controls, but anyone who wants to really experiment, they maybe get into this kind of world. Yeah, but the, and also the patches, what you find is that uh, they can sound different depending on who's playing it, just like a gu guitar can sound differently. And so, and you play a particular patch in a different style because it's been designed to be played in a, in a different style. 
And so and I found when I've gone back to earlier patches I've done, I've been confused. I thought, well, what the hell was I <laughs> thinking of? This thing, this thing sucks. <laughs> it's really but then I raised, oh, yeah, I do this. I, I play in a particular way. And, you know, and so you, um, uh, you adapt those sounds to those particular things, and people find those and th don't change them very much. And the math is intimidating to some people. Yes, at the yeah. beginning, but yeah. uh, as soon as someone explained to you how it works, yeah. it, it's clearer. Uh, uh, yes, the first time it's a little bit complex. Yeah. If you, I if it's the first time, if you haven't used any modular synthesizer before, it could be difficult. But when someone shows you how it works, it's really easy. Mm -hmm. The fact is, um, I think first, the, the first thing you want to do with it is to play with it, to learn to play with it. It could take time to do that. I think you begin to dig in uh, the system as soon as you uh, begin to be cool with the uh, as as playing. And I was exploring the all the patches you have made inside. They're amazing. And you start with a patch, and 30 minutes later you are al <laughs> always playing with it. So I think people I think people will need more time to to learn to play than maybe in a second phase they will try to make their own sound but at the first time this is so fun to use and you can already make tracks um, from the beginning uh, you just play the patch and you are uh, you can making tracks uh, all over the world if you want it's um, it's really amazing i think you need time to to experiment this first then you will need to create your own sound but uh, I I if there was no patches, maybe people will begin to, to try to, to make something better. But I, maybe it's, it could be cool, I think. I think, Cyril, you're also noticing that these things feel like organic yeah. patches. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I found, like, if you use a sampler or you, you have a particular sound, I always feel like I'm playing snapshots. And, and you know, and maybe it's very rich. Maybe if I'm doing an orchestral piece and I'm doing some scoring for something that really fits the bill and it works but I find that there's only so far that that I can explore uh, within that sound and I start to hear the uh, the limitations here but because of the synthesis that we have going on here and also the fact that your finger is playing it and messing up all the time just <laughs> like a human you know just you're just you can't be perfect to like as much as you but that's the beauty that you get in that strive to perfection. You're always trying to reach to it. Whereas there's the patches, there's these static things that, that even if we don't hear it, there's something that happens consciously where we, it's, it becomes this kind of, this limitation. So, um, uh, the, the, well, and that's one of the, you know, as I was explaining earlier about closed architecture within the shark, very little RAM. So consequently, it's not a sampler. And it's not that, that end of it. So. My samplers are, are pretty amazing things, and now we're getting into such large libraries. They're very beautiful uh, sounding things. I, I use them all the times, time, but um, this thing has something else that always kind of speaks on a very organic, personal level. Yeah, this is not a sampler, but I've heard amazing patches with the voice, the human voice. So you, can, you can't record something in real time, for example, but you can, uh, there is uh, audio input, so you, you can use you effect inside and transform something into something else with That's right, the effect. Yeah. But maybe you can analyze uh, uh, a recorded samples and play with it later. There is some, some voice patch already that you can, there is... Um, oh yeah, there's... Um, yeah, you can scrub into a, a complete phrases and it's amazing when you start to do that. You don't want to stop, actually. Yeah, this. Uh, <laughs> you ever have? A I'll just play it in here. You ever have a feeling that you wanted to go, and still have a feeling that you wanted to stay? <laughs> and you can go. <laughs> you ever have a feeling that you wanted? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is amazing. That's uh, an, that's an um, an additive analysis of uh, over time. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, yeah. 
Um, actually, in that case. Uh, uh, yeah, it's an analysis. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's analysis. Yeah. yeah. And, and this was uh, analyzed in Kima using you know the Kima analysis system. And initially, when I did this, it was actually sort of my, as my a. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, initially, when uh, I implemented this, it was uh, sort of as a tickler. So if you would really like to do that, Kima is an excellent system for that because that was analyzed in Kima. And people have asked, oh, can we do our own phrases? And it, it's on the list. Uh, but the other thing is that in Kima, then, because it's a general purpose language, uh, there's many advantages to a, a, a modular like this, but there's also adva advantages to a general purpose language. Mm -hmm. And so if you do use it in Kima, it's very straightforward then to make it do all sorts of other things that you might want to do, uh, as they did in the, in the WALL-E movie, all those robot voices were done with, with, you know, with, with the same uh, out of the sine wave stuff. And, uh, so, so with Kima, then you have uh, much more freedom to go in other directions with it. Okay. But this is something you can do already with the, the continuum. So this is great yeah. because you, you can have classic sounds, classic synthesis sounds. You can have uh, less classics, but modal sounds and uh, all these physical sounds. Yeah. And you can also experiment with that. So there is a large... Uh, pool of sounds Th you can there's try. There's a lot of synthesis techniques that we put into it. The, you could treat this strictly as a classic subtractive synthesizer. And so you have all the basic modules that you would find, all sorts of different filter types, uh, different oscillator types. Um, and then we also have the ability to do FM. So if you're getting into FM, there's you can take the oscillators and do all sorts of FM techniques. Um, and then we have so, uh, some more esoteric things. We have these uh, modal filter banks. So there, so then you start to get in the world of physical modeling. So you have these resonant systems that you can set up, and we have feedback systems that you can set up. That wave, uh, that Christoph in particular has done a lot of waveguide things and a lot of research into that kind of uh, synthesis. And and then we have some uh, 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 sort of like effects that you can design within it to delay lines and and that sort of thing. So there's there's a little bit of everything we have. Uh, an interesting concept of these uh, spectral sets, which are these, we've taken a very short snippet of sound and then microanalyzed it and created these uh, sets of spectra that then you can play through. So like when I played that violin sound, this was originally a single 150 millisecond sample of a viola at this note, just playing like that. But by using the uh, being able to change the formants and change the pitch, you can make this sound natural here. And that's the same spectral set as. If you listen to the original uh, yeah. material there, it's the first 150 milliseconds of a single note, and that's just sort of raw material. It's, uh, actually 12 different spectra uh, uh, as raw material, and those are manipulated then. So it, it's definitely not sampling, but it does have its origin in some recorded sound. It's like wavetable, right? Uh, a, a little bit, I guess. Um, uh, but there's, uh, so there's a, a lot of uh, spectral manipulation then. So it's, it's sort of like uh, modeling with clay or something. You, uh, uh, you, know, you start with something and, and uh, can shape it in many different ways. Yeah, d again, there's often confusion there. That's not sampling in that it's a single uh, a, a, a 150 milliseconds from an instrument. And in fact, uh, we have spectral sets, as he was uh, saying. We have about 30 or 40 of them. Often they're unrecognizable. When, once you start messing with it, you, know, uh, you don't hear the original instrument at all. And in fact, if you really want a violin, it makes much more sense to get a violin player or play a violin yourself. Uh, you'll never have the experience of violin playing by pressing on a piece of neoprene, no matter sure. how nice it is. And, and it's also not the intention. Uh, we have uh, one of the sad things that's happened with synthesizers is that uh, uh, they've been used uh, uh, often to uh, let uh, you make sounds for an instrument that you don't want to bother to learn to play. <laughs> and it's uh, just sort of sad. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Oops. Yeah. Some friends are coming. Okay. <laughs> So, I would like to, no, we have to speak a little bit about the, the concept. No, I would like just to be uh, concrete to explain 
uh, what kind of uh, input, input, sorry, uh, output there is on the machine, how you can control it, what kind of stuff you can plug it in, uh, just to like this, everybody will know what you can do, what you can't uh, without. Would you like to do that? Would you actually perform <laughs> perform the outputs and inputs? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm ready for my performance. Um, so we have a um, power plug on the other end. Uh, there is a stereo output that's suitable for um, <coughs> its line level, um, uh, so it's perfect for recording, but it's also, you can use it for headphones. It has standard MIDI I.O. Um, and it also has a digital connection, it's AES-3, um, and it goes, it works up to 96 kilohertz. Uh, this 192 kilohertz. So we've just improved it. Yes, just yesterday. <laughs> um, nice, nice. <laughs> um, and and this digital uh, interface, you can use it to um, uh, record directly from the digital signal. So, if you're really uh, picky and interested, you can compare the sound quality of the um, uh, digital output as versus the analog output. But um, uh, I mean, I was originally kind of a purist, and I always do everything digitally and clock things, and uh, I've gotten more relaxed in my days, and I realized, geez, you know, the analog output is, is really, really nice, so there's not much of a reason to do that. Um, we also offer um, expansion capabilities. Oh, yes, yeah, so through the digital input, you can clock, you, it will clock through the digital input. You can feed an audio signal in there, and you can process it, and so we have one... Uh, um, a composer that is actually going to be at ContinuCon, which is coming up at the just yes. the beginning on Friday, Thursday night, and he processes one continuum to another one. So oh. he takes the digital output, feeds it in, and essentially creates up these harmonic structures, which he then um, shifts on the on the other continuum. So it's in the concert he'll also do voice. He's a, yeah. So in this concert um, he is also going to process his voice in real time. Um, you should advertise on when that concert is. That concert is um, Saturday night at, uh, what is the theater? Getty Lyric. Getty Lyric. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, half past six, there we are. Uh, you have to buy tickets online now. <laughs> okay, well then here, you, you promote it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, sorry. So, so, so we'll have two days of conference and then we will have a concert at Getty Lyric. Uh, it starts at uh, half past six or seven and lasts for about two hours with five different performers. And uh, yeah, just that's pretty cool. So, so, yeah, and, and so you need to buy the tickets online. We, we, can't, we, we can't sell tickets locally at Get Lyric. So yeah, there is a website at uh, www.continuum.com and you can get the tickets there. Okay, thank you. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, uh, it's, uh, that's an example of. Um, somebody just doing something unique with the instrument that no one else really explores. It's there, but it's, um, it's really cool. Um, uh, it's very beautiful music he does. Uh, th there's also, um, uh, you can use the digital input uh, connection to interface with another um, expander. We have an expander. So you can get um, additional DSP power. Now, normally that's not, um, uh, needed like you there's there's plenty of DSP powers to play with high polyphony on a lot of sounds and you you can get um, very um, a rich textures so the the expander is not necessary however if you're playing any timbres that ring and you want extended polyphony then the expander might be something that you would consider if that's the kind of music that you play um, and lastly uh, we uh, have ju ju just to yeah. expand on, on, on the expander. Yeah. Uh, so having this into the system is like if you have three, uh, three, three, three continuum. Yeah. So imagine three of three sound like this because you can do layers too. That is currently so in, in its infancy, but we are going to expand that capability. Christos yeah. already designed a whole bunch of patches that <laughs> already to do this sort of thing where you take this basic sound and then and then you have a super processor that you affect the sound. Um, yeah, it's well, that's a blossoming of. of uh, possibilities that we want to make sure that we have the right capabilities so that people aren't wasting their time. We, we're, tr we're trying to make the feature set as directly directed as possible. So we, so we don't want multiple ways to do the same thing. We want to figure out the best way to do something. So uh, we have, we sort of been living with that. Um, it, it just, you know, if you have an eight voice uh, um, 
sound in here, now you have a 24 voice, or if you have a nine voice, it's now 27, mm. whatever. Um, and uh, that's just basic expanded polyphony, but it also does multiple processing. Uh, and also it could be cool to, because if you want only one DSP, if you change sounds, uh, the, 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 the main sound is, is cut to change. Uh, that's right, yeah. And when you have expander, you can uh, well do some, n not some, s you, you as you have two DSP, you can morph, well, not morphing, but I pass know what from. You mean, yeah, you, yeah. You, you hold a chord, you play, the, you hit the new patch, and this thing still sounds, it doesn't cut out. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so for live yeah. situation, it could be live very situation important. Could be very right. useful, or in a very basic level, you do a split. So, you know, you've already designed this bass sound, but now you want this pad on top. Like a very, you know, basic things. Yeah, those sort of things will be in there. But we have so many possibilities with the way, because this digital connection is so flexible, there's so many different ways that we could set it up. There's just ways that uh, you just really wouldn't want to use. Like so, I mean, you, you have to think about the arc this architecture in that you have a polyphonic performance, but then it gets summed into a single DSP as an output. How does it relate to another one that you're feeding an input to, but you have another polyphonic uh, performance? So sometimes that could be an interesting world to explore, but sometimes it could just be a complete waste of time. So. That's our job, to save you from <laughs> wasting time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, wait, we didn't, last two inputs. There's two pedal inputs. Yes. So w one of the uh, common things to do in, uh, uh, in synthesizer is to layer sounds. And that can be useful here, but it's much less important here than it would be in, in other systems because so much of this depends on what you're doing with your fingers and most of the interest of this instrument really comes from how do you map finger motions to the sound. Uh, making a thicker sound often really doesn't help that problem. And so, uh, so it just ends up being a less important thing. Similarly with polyphony, most people can play what two or three fingers maybe accurately on the surface so except for the situation where you have uh, the decay of a sound last a long time it's actually rare to need the higher prolyphony uh, so the the basic unit uh, does a lot of these things and even a split is in uh, if you listen pick your favorite acoustic instrument if you if you like uh, oboe or you like uh, violin or something the fact that it's one instrument playing the whole time is okay. Uh, you're really listening for something else. So most people that go this route will really be getting the continuum for that. Um, so the, the, all of those other things are, are very uh, useful, but uh, not as essential here as they are in, in, in other systems, I think. And, and so that's, that's one of the reasons why we don't advertise it that much. It's true, you can layer, it's true, you can uh, uh, post-process, you can do all these things, but uh, in practice, uh, if, if you have performance like Ed does, uh, just practicing the, the small finger motions is very important. I think it's uh, similar in a, in a violin or something. You know, you might spend some time trying to pick the rosin you like or getting a bow you really like, but in the end, most of your time is spent practicing. And most of your sound comes from, not from what bow you're using or what violin you're playing, but uh, you, you know, a great violinist can still take that $100 violin from China and make it sound pretty darn good. So, uh, uh, yeah, so it's that sort of situation. Okay. There is also two sides, actually, because there is only two models. It's, it's been, you work on this uh, since uh, 37 years, but <laughs> there is two models to, cho to, to, to choose from. And I think it's cool because you don't have to scratch your head. Wha what, what do I need? You just have to say, do I need the small one or the big one? We all want the big one, but it's not always possible. But um, so the, there is two size, the, the half size, which is, well, the It's half the size. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, well, so it's, there's four PCBs in here. And uh, right. then yeah. Yeah, uh, PCBs for the sensor board. And so if you imagine you only have two, that's what's in a half size. It is exactly half size, well, the middle um, half. But the engine is exactly the same. So anything designed for a half size is completely compatible with a full size. They both have exactly the same power. They both work with, with the digital signals and they work with MIDI in exactly the same way. Yes, and when you play first with a, a full size and when you play with a half, si half size first, you miss um, a way to play bass and uh, 
uh, well uh, because it's very interesting to have yeah. the bass and the comment dit aigu déjà en anglais j'ai oublié Trebles, Treble. oh yeah, trebles at the same time. Thank you. Yeah. But um, you can use a, a, a pedal that is uh, with three uh, three switch pedals that uh, on the half size like this. You can go to bass from trebles with the foot. So this is cool because you can um, keep this impression to play bass and treble at the same time, but with a pedal. So yes, and even if you. When you switch, let's suppose you play a note you're and you've, you've transposed it up quite high and you're playing a very high note, like at this note, let's say, but it's on your half size. If you switch it down, it's not going to switch. Then, you're, then if you play yeah. here, it's going to be a much bigger difference. So it makes it kind of seamless that you can switch the area as you're playing and not have these notes jump. Yeah, so this is a yeah. cool thing to add. Yeah, and it doesn't require any sort of... There's we have built-in octave switching in the editor. So you can design a patch and then say, okay, well, at a particular point, instead of using my sustain pedal for sustain, it's going it's now my octave transpose or yeah. three octave transpose switch. You could, uh, you could like do uh, Christos tin whistle, right? That's always high, no matter where you play it. Of course, he has a half size. <laughs> and uh, well, yeah, like you can have sounds that naturally. So it's you know you, that sound's been transposed to work within kind of the natural range that you would find in a half size. Okay, yeah. um, maybe we can talk with your work, the again Matrix, right now okay. because we uh, so everything is inside, but you can plug. You have uh, an edi a free editor you can use. That's right. Um, Mac or PC. Mac or PC, yes, and. Uh, so this is just just an uh, editor so uh, it's um, an easy way to 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 use it uh it was complicated tonight to have um us uh, recorded with a screen we will do that later but maybe you, you can show to the camera maybe yeah. just how it looks uh like this everybody can see how it looks Okay, so you have a matrix there, and you, with your mouse, you you have input there, input there, and you can, yes, you can do some uh, pinpoint uh, inside. And uh, yeah, this area is the matrix, mm -hmm. kind of like top three. Yeah, it's like one of the formulas. Yeah. So now, what he's done? What you selected? What did you select? Oh yeah, formula C. And, and so if you have formula C anywhere in this matrix, you can get to the mathematical part of it. We tried to keep everything on a single screen because we didn't want to do any sort of menu diving. And, and what you always see within this structure is your complete patch all the time. And in that patch, we have these what we call thumbnails of all the vi available formulas. And the thumbnail is just sort of a quick way to say, oh, yes, I've got some Z parameters I've got programmed in. Oh, this one uses Y, or this one uses is mapped to my uh, second pedal. And so it's easier to figure out, well, you know, when I play this pedal, a cha the sound changes. How is it changing? Well, you just look at what formula is using the pedal, and then you look at where it is, and then you click on it, and, it, and it'll show you that uh, particular formula. So, I mean, I mean it's simple on the surface, um, and the math has been streamlined to be as useful and musical as we could make it, <coughs> but um, it can get very deep, too. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and there's only, you know, what we say is there's only, is it 20, 24 formulas? 24, yeah. 25, 26 uh, formulas, but you can have multiple, the same formula in multiple points, which is kind of a nice thing to be able to do. So for instance, let's say you, you have the stereo output that you're feeding into the submix, you just put the same formula into left and right, and now you can control the overall volume. Or you take a particular formula and you invert one of the channels. So imagine if you had this stereo ping pong effect that you did because you inverted one, but now you change this same formula because there's multiple formulas on one end. When you change this one, you can change the, the way that the effect changes, but not the, the fact that it's oscillating back and forth. So there, there's a lot of capabilities in there um, and what we've tried to do is just eliminate 
the um, useless ends, uh, you know, there's so much math that could be applied, but some things maybe are theoretically interesting, but not really, really, you know, what we find sort of interesting. It's dangerous, too. You have a matrix where it's everything's open, but it's like if you put your fingers in a plug, it's <laughs> dangerous. Or if you just randomly patch, you know, and you have your output and you decide you're going to patch an output, or you do a loop and do an output, you can hurt your ears. So in, in a modular system, you just have to, you know, think about it before you patch, but essentially you can patch anything into anything in the system. Uh, I want to talk a li little bit with the quantize function. Bec uh, because um, it's very smart how it, it, ha it has been implemented inside. Yeah. Um, as we, we have seen before, you can play freely. It's uh, at the beginning, it's a little bit hard to play um, if you haven't played it for the first time, but you can use quantize and there is, um, uh, you can morph from uh, no quantize to 100% quantize. And with with only a button, so this is cool because you can just select the level where you are. Uh, so, can you show us how it, it does to the sound when you are fuel quantized? Sure. And so I have a single oscillator here. Okay, unquantized. Here is a hundred per percent quantized. Very hard to do vibrato this way. Um, in fact, impossible, uh, unless you were into semitone vibrato. <laughs> and then you, and so that's a, um, uh, uh, that's you know we're using uh, seven bit MIDI data values. So that's 127 of the quantizing. But then what you can do is um, uh, you can s you can specify an amount of quantize. So imagine it's like you're coming home from the bar, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, you really shouldn't have had that last schnapps, and you know, you're walking down the street, and there's someone pulling you into the middle of the sidewalk all the time. Well, that's what Quantize is doing. It's always pull you right into the pitch center, so when you're over here, it uh, fixes you up. So. so now I can play. And it's always quantizing, but I can still do the vibrato. So and that's that's addressable. You can assign that to a pedal. You can assign that to the Y direction. So you could play down here and not have quantize, and here have quantize. So I've done that sometimes in a performance where you're concentrating on your right hand. So you say, okay, I just can't keep my head in, in the game with my left hand. So you play up here with your left hand where it's quantized pretty much, and then you play freely with your right hand with the lead line. So there's a lot of different implementations for this normal quantize that we have. There's also um, a different type of quantize. We have a quantize on initial. So one of the patches I played was this kind of a kalimbus type sound. So this has what's called an initial quantize. So it doesn't matter where you hit within that semitone, it says instantly, I'm put putting you on pitch. And then I will deviate from there. So you don't have to think so much it's always going to be right on pitch, but you still get all the flexibility of the pitch change, and you don't get, I don't get that police officer pulling me into the middle of the sidewalk all the time, you know. So um, uh, that's a very useful type of quantization for pluck sounds, because you're going to hit this, the uh, sound like that, and you kind of want it to hit right into the pitch center. And the third type of quantizing we have is quantizing on release. So this one is useful if you have a sustained sound and you're playing it and once your finger leaves the surface, you can't influence the pitch. So maybe you don't really want quantize, but what you don't want to do is be in a situation where you've plucked at it, accidentally gotten a little bit off, and you really want the pitch, but you can't correct it because your finger's already left making the sound. So we put in a release quantize. So as you can see, there is a lot of details uh, for play. So this is not only s some things made by uh, an engineer, uh, but also by a musician. So I think yeah. it's very imp important because um, with the both sides, uh, it's amazing. So uh, one thing important to mention about quantizing, it's really good if you get into playing this thing, is you want to develop finger memory so that you start to feel the way that a third feels or a fifth feels within the space of your fingers. 
because it's it's nice because uh, it's th always going to be the same. The, you know, the, the surface is completely linear. Uh, the only thing it has in common with a, with a piano keyboard is the octave is the same size, but it's not, you know, piano pitches are not linear. Um, this is completely linear, and you want to develop the finger memory, and what you want to play that way, and then maybe on stage, like uh, some people do this, so they practice unquantized, but they know stage is just it's a little too much, so I, I'm going to play, but, but, you know, with a bit of quantization just to be on the safe side. And the biggest discovery that I found was when I played this thing, uh, you don't realize how tied in you are to equal temperament. Mm. And there's a lot of beauty, like if you listen to a string quartet, like yeah. it's just, and so now when you play something, I'm always making the um, thirds <laughs> just a little bit flat, flat the major, more pleasing to the ear, and you do it naturally. You know, you won't, you won't catch yourself doing it. If you listen to a good string chord, they're always adjusting, always doing something harmonically related. So it brings you back in, t in tune with what, you know, having ears and, and being part of the harmonic series that human beings are. Yeah, yeah. At some point, it's, yeah. it's a way to, to free a musician, to, to, uh, to cliche, because yeah. uh, this is funny because even beginners that tried for the first time, they tend to do Indian, Indian music because you can do some, some things like this. And everybody is doing that at some point because uh, it feels so natural that mm -hmm. uh, s s at s you, you begin to play another music that you don't play every day. But the instrument uh, put you on your hands the power to do this. So with your ears you correct yourself and you begin to 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 have interest into other music too so yeah this is not so classic well and you learn playing techniques as you're doing this you learn you know like vibrato is not just a pitch wheel and it's you know there's there's timbre and volume and all sorts of change speed changes and changes that you go that way and you can play just from using pressure you can play melodies just with a single finger You know, just by hitting in between, lifting up a little bit. So there are all sorts of different playing techniques that you wouldn't, um, uh, you know, just associate with any sort yeah, of piano. Of the yeah. The yeah, so like, uh, what is this? Let's see if I sort this down. So here, this. So with this sound, what it's doing when you have only a single voice allocated and you play two f places on the surface what it's going to do is you can imagine between your two fingers your two fingers it's like this big seesaw and so as you press it there's a ball that's going to roll from one finger to the other so you can have you can play a game with yourself it's impossible to play a melody this <laughs> way but you can i'll show you so i'm going to play okay. a no low note and then touch on softly and then i'm going to try to change That's very, that's very hard, and that was very shitty. But, <laughs> um, but that's like 21%, 21 bit. Is that 21 bit uh, uh, calculations uh, that you're doing within about there? About 15 bit section there. Okay. But, but the, uh, like, compare a trill either way or something. Because, right, the trills and turns are really affected by that. Like, uh, sliding or not. Like, play a trill like this, and then play a trill the other way. What do you mean, like this? <laughs> and then play it, uh, play it oh, so you play, like, little melismas, like... So it's going back and forth, but if I was to play that just where it normally is, you don't get the slide in between the, the okay. fingers. And so that's a useful playing technique. Um, so normally when you play in semitones, it's going to slide because the notes are so close. But we've set up this window where you can say, okay, I like that effect, but if I play anything within an interval, let's say like a major third, it's going to do that effect. But if I play larger, it knows it's two separate notes. And that this is programmable for every single preset. So for instance, here now I've turned it on. So if I play a minor third. But if I add. So 
that knows the dis the difference between the long distance and the short distance. Okay. Uh, later on, we were talking about expander. We haven't talked yet about the CV extender because we can use this the power of this sensibility to to play with uh, all CV and gate instruments also. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, Hidden within the uh, output of the um, uh, uh, MIDI output, uh, the two unused pins have a nice squared C serial connection, and that connects to an external box called the, the CVC. It's a control voltage conver converter. And then you can take, within the formula or within the presets that we have, <laughs> you can design, uh, you have 16 um, analog outputs, and it converts them into high quality 16 analog outputs that you can then map into the, uh, the um, analog modular world. And we have presets for sort of Moog ranges or like Bokla ranges, and, um, but it's completely customizable. You can take any of the pin power that you have within those formulas and use them the same way. So for instance, if you just had a single input to a VCA, a, a cutoff point, and you wanted to control that uh, within, you only have one input within that single output of the 16 you could map that put that into your VCF and that in the matrix you could assign say <coughs> you know uh, typically I want the filter to get brighter as I go up and as I play harder it's going to go up uh, it's going to it's going to go even further up so we get that brightness effect uh, and as I go back left and right it's going to go down or up uh, proportionately and also if I go way up here it's going to introduce an LFO or like a phase generator effect so you can take this one output and combine a combination of control values all from one finger and control that particular parameter. So I can get really deep really quickly. Yeah. But it's a, ch it's a tricky thing to, you know, to map into because <coughs> it's inherently polyphonic. You know, it wants mm. to be polyphonic. And of course, you know, most modular systems, you either do set it up as a big monophonic force that's going, or you set up subsystems that go, some automata and some things that you play live. So it's, you know, it's a varying degrees that you'll get with it. But something like what Dita Duffer did, um, you know, announced with that four voice, yeah. I think that's exactly the kind of thing that you can map into this really easily. But if you're more experimental too, it does all sorts of wonderful things. Yeah, like the voice, the voice example you showed before was a two-handed thing where you're controlling a single note with two hands. You can also do that in the module uh, for the modular. Voice. That's right. Yeah, you could do that sort of thing. So, like, yeah, if I play that voice, if you look at my left, anything that I play on the top part of the um, surface, I'm controlling the formant, and anything that I'm doing on the bottom is the pitch. So I'll just play something. Okay. Here. It doesn't sound here until I give it a formant. <laughs> My left hand is moving, I'm getting the formant changes. So I can instantly change, and now here's pitch, for formant. Okay, so um, do you want to add something to the matrix before we go? We talk a little bit about sound design uh, without. Do you want to add any, anything else? No, that's no. I'm glad to know you. <laughs> 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 uh, likewise, yeah, I'm glad I know me. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay, so Christophe, please come in. Uh, so first of all. Bon, tu es français. On pourrait oui. parler français, mais on va continuer en anglais. Um, can you say when you meet up the team and when you? Yeah, I, tu as I, compris. I, I, I came. I, I w the first time I saw a video of the continuum, I was amazed, and that was exactly the kind of things I, I was dreaming of. So I put money aside, and uh, the first time I had sufficient money, I, I bought it. It was in 2007. And so I had the same uh, kind of uh, continuum than Ed, so with Fire Warrior and no, no internal sound, sound, sound engine. Um, 
so and since I'm a developer, uh, I thought I need some some engine, so I developed mine on a, an, an iOS app, and I decided to go to Music Nessa and show them uh, the, the app, and then I, d I discovered that they did their own sound engine at the same time, <laughs> 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 and that was much better than mine. So, but 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 now that's it. So uh, fun f w which was funny, is that the way I've done it was using also physical modeling techniques, but different ones. And now we are working together with uh, Lipple to implement uh, this uh, on, on the Shark DSP. So that's going to be an additional uh, physical modeling uh, features for, for, for the continuum. So that, that's not lost. <laughs> and th the app is still available and is available also for controlling the continuum. N not to do the, the sound design, but select the, the patches. And, and, and so when you're on stage, it's, it's quite convenient. I'm using it. Uh, for yeah, for because sound. we need to maybe to explain why it is interesting to have uh, maybe a little controller to choose sound because uh, as you can see there is no button uh, to it well there is one button, button to the left a small red button here. one mm, only yeah. one one is enough sometimes <laughs> and um, <laughs> with a uh, with a combination of button you can choose uh, the main function of the synthesizer you can change the sounds you can change your patch uh, but uh, it's uh, if you want to be more free, it's better to have a MIDI controller to change yeah. sounds. And so you you have developed this app uh, right now. This is only iOS, right? Yeah, yes, only uh, since since there's uh, a synth inside. Yes, and, and only for for really synthesizer, the la latency is important and only works on on, on iOS. Yes, Google, if you were uh, us, please make yeah, some work yeah. on your <laughs> DSP engine yeah. because <laughs> this is not so great. Um, so you develop uh, you develop. Uh, the engine too, but you you make sounds too. Yeah, yeah. I'm also doing some sound design. So, so can you can you explain how do you approach sound design when you work with yeah, this machine? It's very different from what we are doing usually. So uh, as explained by Ed, you have a lot of different feature, specifically the the, the physical modeling. So you can do waveguides and model synthesis and uh, stuff what that people are not used to. So you you need to be a bit trained to this. But the, the, the really the main thing is, and we, we talked a lot about this, that the playing style, the playing technique is very important. So when you design a sound for the, the uh, continuum, uh, half of the time or, or sometimes more, is it's not spent on the sound itself, but on the connection with, with the surface and how, how, how to, to uh, uh, sculpt your sound while you're playing. So on a regular sense, once once your sound is done, you press UK, you get your sound, and that's all here. You're thinking what's going to happen when you modulate, when you slide from one song, one note to another. Is it going to have some additional noise, or how, what, what are going to be the, the interaction? Uh, how do you sh should you play it mono or, or polyphonic, or, or will there be some difference uh, depending on, on mono or, or not? So that, that's a lot of time you spend on 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 the, the way people interact with the sound so that's a, a very important thing and and also one thing which is very uh, uh, funny is that sometimes I, s I spend a lot of time on the sound uh, I have it and, and and later on I hear some somebody playing the something and say, oh, what is this <laughs> huge sound and I just discovered that it's one of the one I did <laughs> but it's played on a totally different way that than what I, I, I saw it before so you don't you often don't recognize your sound. So you, you are not designing sound that is itself, you're just providing uh, some basic sound structure that people are going to interact with and they are going to create their own sound the way they play. So that's yes, a you need You need to be a performer that. with that. You, you you need to be a little bit of a performer uh, yeah. Yeah, to think about this. Yeah, yeah. You need to know what, what are the possible techniques and, and how you can uh, interact and, and also imagine New way, new ways of interacting. Uh, for example, I recently did a streaming uh, interaction, uh, so, so you, you need also to try to match uh, to, 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 to find, science, find some new ways of, of interacting. Okay. With one or uh, how many time did you spend to learn the basics of it? Um, and maybe you can show us the little techniques you can use, uh, you have learned to use. For example, at the beginning to do some vibrato and how do you put your yeah. finger into this and maybe other stuff you have discovered when you have learned this instrument yeah, yes. yeah one thing i, I like to, to to show so that's no vibrato you can start just rocking your finger having so, but you, 
you can also decide to use several fingers to do your vibrato. So if I put three finger, you're going to have a much wider vibrato, but you also can decide to have your vibrato, vibrato not centered. For example, uh, 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 violin players go to lower pitch, so you can use one finger on the low. It's going to be lo lower vibrato. You can use your finger up and on a cotal, you only can pitch up, so that, that's a way. And you also can slide your vibrato and, and go more ceremon slide the style. So only the vibrato, you can do several ways, several manner of having your vibrato, and, and then you also have the tremolo. And you, you can combine vibrato and, and tremolo together while, while playing. So you need to think about all, all these small, small things and, 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 and design your sound so it's going to manage all, all these small, small details. And if I take, uh, you can have also some. Just to show you your notes, I can bring the slide and this is an interesting effect. Oh, yeah. Uh, So this is a, 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 a this is a FDN, so feedback delay network, so it's a weird way of, of designing sound. Mojo, mojo of FDN. Okay, I've got your name now. So that scratching this with this, and 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 that's funny because there, there's nothing really scratching, but when you do it, it's very natural. That's really scratching, and, and that gives you a scratching sound. Yes. So that's the kind of things I, I like to work on. So really, the, the interaction itself and the different ways. This is why you are not in front of a classic keyboard, but you are experimenting with different uh, way of playing. So yeah, mm -hmm. and you have fun because this is the first time we play with this kind of stuff. So uh, there is real joy yeah, <laughs> when yeah, you yeah. play this. It, it also, you discover uh, so Liverpool has provided us a, a, a playing area, and, and then you, you can I imagine whatever you you, you want. Uh, but when I started using the Matrix, there, there was no. Uh, physical modeling on the on the waveguide domain, so I said uh, since Ed is doing some amazing stuff on our model, I said well, I'm not going to try to compete with him on the model domain, but 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 there's an area for me on on the on the physical modeling and on waveguide side. So I did a set of waveguide, and then it was working well. So uh, Lippold added the micro delay, which is which is giving even more power to waveguide. So that's what I'm using here on on, on this on this preset. And that's an, an open game. That there's no previous knowledge of how to do all this, and you can just imagine and try. So it's try and fail. So oh. you, you you fail nine times, and you manage to yeah. do something right once. But, but then then you're happy, and then that's again and again. Mm -hmm. and so, so, so. Okay. Uh, before maybe another sequence of playing by you, maybe. Oh, okay. uh, do you want to add something? Uh, about the continuum, about I don't know what you want to add. Okay. Mention the counter, please. Yeah, so yeah, pl pl please, you can come yeah. to the counter on, on, on uh, uh, next Saturday, uh, six, six, uh, half past six at Gaiety. Voilà. Si vous êtes sur Paris, profitez-en. Ouais. C'est euh, c'est rare, on peut. Ouais. Um, I also want to say that um, yes, this instrument is expensive, but I think you have un, you understand why uh, it's made by a very small team, but uh, there is always updates about the software, and this is free. And uh, this is not small updates. Uh, things have evolved uh, in a way that is completely uh, crazy. And um, I, I've heard some stuff with the future update, and this is amazing. So, yeah. The the the, um, the community uh, about this instrument is fantastic too. Uh, this is only uh, good vibration, and uh, it's uh, you know it's not always the case when uh, instruments 
are made by big company. Uh, this is not the same spirit at all, uh, because there is maybe sometimes too much. Um, uh, how can I say that? Stages between the head and the musician, but there. Everybody is connected uh, and we can reach us very easily. We can send you mails and uh, you you like music. So this is, we can feel that on this environment. So uh, this is a really special instrument. So uh, yeah, maybe we can start with some question. questions. So yeah. Yes, I'd like to know if you've been approached by one of the bigger companies that he was talking about. Still under the radar. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we, we've uh, uh, certainly talked to people that work for those companies, but I think uh, anything, the things that sell well are things that are very much like what you're already familiar with, that work with things that you're familiar with, but give you new capabilities. And this is just a little bit too much new. So it's a, I think it's a, a, a scary thing for, uh, uh, you know, for the bigger companies to get involved in, and uh, they'll... They'll wait until uh, uh, until it grows and until they're cooked. really sure yeah. this is a safe deal. Okay. So. Thank you. Uh, the, would you say that the gestural gestural approach of the of the instrument is giving uh, experimental organic uh, sound? Is it is it is it was it your main goal when developing the it instrument? Yeah, it was. Uh, I wanted to make some, I mean, in, in, when I started, actually, there was a lot more continuous control. There were, you know, the CS80 and these sorts of things that were, that were, uh, uh, at least had ribbons and such, and okay. polyphonic aftertouch was more common, at least once MIDI came out, and that sort of thing. Uh, th there was, you know, interest in more of that, but there was actually less and less of that, and it got to be uh, more and more sophisticated uh, in some ways, but as far as what the musician is doing, right, that, uh, there is a freedom. I mean, with a MIDI keyboard, that you only start and stop things. There is a real freedom in that because now you can play very quickly. You can play uh, very complex music and not have to worry about all these other details. So it's not all bad. But this world of continuous control wasn't there. So my my intention was I looked at uh, some well what I was familiar with uh, with violin and orchestral instruments about what kind of accuracy would you need to control that kind of sound. And I wasn't really sure what even that kind of sound was, but I could tell that, hey, you know, it's kind of odd that this fat finger is active 30 microns. It's odd that you can hear, you know, all sorts of details. Um, and then in other ways, there's lots of things you can't hear. Okay. So I was just trying to make something that could at least detect from the human what was going on. Right. So what you're saying is the, the invent, invention, the experimenting, the experimenting and in inventing new patches, new sounds, new new technique for playing is what scares big companies for. for yeah, I think it's too different. I, I mean, I think if you uh, uh, if you make something that you know with this, you can use it with your modular systems, and and actually a lot of modular people have interest. Also, people that have done crazy things like played theremin. Okay, th those people are, you know, uh, uh, th th you know, th those kinds of people are, are just happy with it. But uh, for most people, if they've already invested a lot in a big studio and they have all of the synthesizer equipment, it's really not ideal for triggering samples. And if you've spent a huge amount of money uh, in sample libraries, it's not bad for that, but there's other ways to do that. And so uh, I, I think the... Uh, strings with the strings and, and, and uh, instruments really, I mean, you can feel a real difference between strings triggered by the continuum and, and strings from a regular keyboard. I mean, it's, it's yeah, really uh, closer uh, to yeah. real time. Yeah, it's actually funny there. I, I think people underestimate. You don't hear it right away always, or at least I don't. Uh, but uh, uh, when you uh, are uh, playing a string instrument, the fact that you're not picking out, a, I mean, we can do tuning tables here and quantization, all these things. But the fact that you're not normally picking out of a 12 pitches, wh whether they're equal tempered or otherwise, uh, that's really different. And I think over the long term, uh, that's one of the things you hear is that uh, the micro tuning and then also the adjustments, like Ed was saying, you're, you're always striving for perfection, but you're not there. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that's actually a positive thing. <laughs> uh, and we're so used to now this 
very, very uh, you know, perfect playing, and every time you play a note, uh, it's, it's quite perfect. Uh, yeah, that's not always a good thing. And then just adding randomness or, quote, humanizing isn't enough. Uh, it's nice to have something from a human. Yeah, thank you for the demo. It was very nice. Uh, one midi question. Uh, if you perform something with all those controls and you record the MIDI in a computer, how will it perform or will you play back the MIDI information? Into a, will it perform the same way or is it? Be before, uh, before Ed goes for it, I, I do want to say we make very little effort to make this work with MIDI keyboards or even with, uh, it'll play its own MIDI data. Uh, uh, if you really have all the controller data or if you have your own algorithm or something that, that makes all that data, yes, then it'll play. Uh, but uh, we haven't made much of an effort to make it play. Uh, for instance, just the other day I was asked, well, I have a MIDI keyboard hooked up to it. Why isn't it making sound? Well, uh, it's just, it, for us, that's sort of disappointing because all the sounds are really carefully made for this interaction. And when you have zero interaction, I don't <coughs> know what people are expecting, but it's, uh, it's a little bit like if I play theremin, it's not a beautiful instrument. I mean, the back and forth with the same synthesizer, if you play the continuum, that will work, but I want to give Ed a chance here. So yeah, well I've done that. Well, in fact, what you can do is you can um, compare. You can disconnect the internal MIDI connection, and you can it's feed the MIDI in software, and then feed the MIDI out to the MIDI in and play it, and it works great. I've also used it with Logic Pro and recorded the MIDI stream out of it, and then uh, played it back, and it works perfectly well. But what I, when I tend to use it in the studio, I tend to record just the audio because the right. MIDI data is not useful be, because it's really tied to the sound. So if you say you did it with a brass sound, a brass-like sound, and then you, you want to take that and then um, uh, use it so that you're um, uh, uh, playing it with, a, with a, a flute or something, you just play it a different way. So the MIDI data is not quite relevant. It's only relevant in things like if you were to take the data and then decide, oh, I'm not in E flat, I want to be in G. So you can transpose quite easily. Yeah, you just added it. Well, what happens when you're playing a note? It, it sends down a, well, not in this case, it's <laughs> <laughs> but it's sending down a, uh, a note on uh, information and a, and a pitch. And then, all the, and then it's pitch bend. So each no finger is a separate MIDI channel. So it's using the pitch bend data to, to bend the note. So if you can imagine if, so I had that MIDI data and it was an F2, and then I transpose it to A flat to, it, everything would play. But you wouldn't really use it if you changed the tempo. Now all your vibratos are too slow or fast. Like everything is, and, and also it's, uh, you know, this, you can use a, like um, Steinberg's Cubase did the, uh, the, that expression control that's tied to a note. So that's, that's actually a, a significant thing if you really want to get into data because in a, in a DAW like Logic, that uh, a CC information that it's sending out is completely divorced from the note. So if you decide to make a note shorter, well, you, you can't, it's, it's just very messy. And, and what I've also found in, in working with this professionally is that uh, there's so many things you can do with audio. In, you know, in terms of like analyzing it, quantizing it, even pitch shifting that, if you, in a pinch that, that work quite well, so yeah. So you but but, but in, to answer that basic question, the MIDI data is there. We're using full bandwidth usually, so you can't combine it down the standard, you know, baud stream um, because it's it's really quite there. Strangely, we you know we've been very picky with the type of MIDI interfaces we use because a lot of them don't follow the you know they, they can you know people talk about MIDI being too slow. Well, a lot of interfaces can't keep up with MIDI. So much less the software. Yeah. For instance, in Logic, in Logic, you have to be very careful to turn off all the features that reorder MIDI messages and do all these other things that uh, you'd be very surprised go on unless you go out of your way to turn them off. Well, in Logic, there's a basic control that says, um, and it's activated once you launch it until you turn it off, which is uh, MIDI data reduction. So that they, they take the data and they, um, they, this, they give you what they think is useful. Or if you use something like um, Bitwig uh, recently had a, um, uh, you know, has MPE support and it records the data. Well, what they do 
Um, and I, I saw it, and I, I'm really not a big fan. But if you make a gesture, they'll take that data, and then they'll say, that kind of looks like a Bezier curve. you know. So I'm going to give you a nice Bezier curve and give you these points. It's an approximation of what you just played. So um, it, it seems to be going the wrong way for dealing with mi MIDI. So um, sticking with audio really works quite well. Yeah. Another question, maybe? Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, through MIDI. And uh, there, is, there is a specific mode dedicated to Schema still available, even if there is no more via wire interface. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. I think, please come. I think they can have some applause for all of that. Yeah. No. <laughs> Yeah, we will not see that every day. And again, thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, if you want to try this, don't forget that we have one there every day. So, and uh, uh, yeah, you can try it there. And maybe we can finish with some music. May, uh, if you want to play together, or I don't know, but you are free to, to do what you want. Do you want to play a violin? No, no, no. Thank you. Well, it's over. Um, uh, I say, well, we, I don't know when the, the next uh, meeting from Modular Square will be out. Uh, please come to our Facebook page and we'll know all of that. And uh, thank you, merci d'être venu ce soir ici. Merci beaucoup à ceux qui sont déplacés. Et on vous dit à très bientôt. Au revoir.